welcome to our first tutorial on biology okay so let's begin when applied to the medical genital consulting genetic consulting center for information about the risks of hemophilia in her son in her son her husband has been suffering from this disease since birth so look at it her husband has been suffering from the disease and we know her husbands are what x y okay woman and her parents are healthy so the woman is healthy does do not have hemophilia is the boy likely to have the disease in this family is the boy likely to have the disease in this family first of all we said that hemophilia is an x-linked recessive gene or disorder it is an x-linked recessive uh disorder x-linked so that means that we're talking about x prime x prime so let's find out if all the boys are let's see the risks of having a boy with hemophilia let's see the risks of having a boy with hemophilia i believe you know or you understand this diagram okay so here we have what x and then x prime over here we have what x y over here we have what x x prime and over here we have what x y so looking at this the girls are carriers of hemophilia but they, they don't have hemophilia but they are just what carriers look at the males or the boys none of them is having the hemophilia and so therefore all the boys uh, will be healthy all the boys will be healthy so the answer is c all the boys will be healthy all right a man is suffering from hereditary disease married a healthy woman again the man is suffering from it and married a healthy woman they've got five children three girls and then two boys all the girls inherited their father's disease and you know that father is xy so if all the girls inherited the father's disease that means that this disease is found on the x chromosome it means because that's the only time that the father can donate his x gene or the x chromosome to the baby girl okay so that means that the father is what the disease is found on the what on the x on the x but then again if all the girls are having it that means this uh, gene is actually what is not recessive but rather what dominant it is a dominant what gene a dominant because even one is found in the girl the girl will have what the disease the girl will have the disease and that is why over here we are going for what for a dominant x linked a dominant x linked a dominant x link again the only time the father will donate is what or the only thing the father will donate to the baby girl will be the x chromosome for the boys to be the y chromosome but for the girls it will definitely be what the x chromosome from the father x chromosome from the father so this is x linked dominant dominant all right again we are having an ecg of a 45 year old old man showed there's absence of p wave and what brings the p wave what brings the p wave is when there is what atrial contraction and before the atrium will contract it means that impulses must come from the what sino arterial node it means impulses must come from the sino arterial node so if there's a problem with impulse from the sino arterial node what it means is that p wave will not show or it will not contract the atrium will not contract so the question now is what part of the contacting system is blocked so again you are thinking of what sino arterial node so your answer is what b in ventric arterial ventricular node you are thinking of what the ventricles the ventricles the ventricles that means the ventricles are not contracting so if they are said the qrs complex is absent that means uh, there is av blockage av blockage that is just by the way all right this is why i said the questions are, are repeating themselves 
when a patient with a traumatic impairment of the brain was examined, it was observed that he had stopped distinguishing uh, displacement of an object on the skin. On the skin. And again, we spoke about the gyrosis. We spoke about what the gyrus and into this specific, we talk about what proprioception or the sense of touch, the sense of touch. In the sense of touch, we are definitely thinking of what the posterior central gyrus, posterior central gyrus. And again, posterior, this is what sensory what information that is touch, 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 touch. In the pre central uh, gyrus, we are thinking of what motor information. We are thinking of motor information. In occipital loop, we are thinking of what seeing. Occipital loop, you are thinking of what seeing. And cerebellum deals with what movement and posture. Movement and posture. Then the temporal loop deals with hearing. The temporal loop deals with hearing. So basically, these are the things that you need to know. So your answer here is E posterior central gyrus or post central gyrus. We've done this. That's why I'm not just uh, brushing over it. Different functional groups can be presented in the structure of L amino acid radicals. Identify the group that is able to form ester bond. Identify the group that is able to form ester bond. In other words, if you want to form an ester bond, which one of these will you use to form an ester bond? And before you can get that, you need to know what an ester bond is. So what then is a, an ester? Ester is even a mess here. So an ester is simply a chemical compound that is derived from an acid in which at least one hydroxyl group is replaced by uh, an oxyl group. I repeat, this occurs whereby or it is derived from an acid, an acid in which at least one OH group, one OH group, one OH group is replaced by O group, by O group, by O group. In other words, it is formed when a carboxylic acid reacts with an alcohol. When a carboxylic acid react with an alcohol and this will produce water and ester. The process is called esterification. The process is called esterification. So again, what are you thinking about over here? We are definitely looking at for what? Hydroxy group. Therefore, OH. 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 So again, whereby at least one hydroxy group is replaced by an oxygen. That is where an ester is formed or ester bond is formed. The conjugated protein necessary, necessarily contains special component as a non-protein part. The conjugated protein necessarily contains, contains special components as a non-protein part. Choose the substance that can't, cannot carry out this function. Choose a substance that cannot carry out this function. In other words, which one of these is what? It's a non-protein what? Part. Non-protein part. Non-protein part. So that means you need to understand what a, a protein part is, non-protein part is in a protein. Or oh, yeah, the conjugated what protein. So you need to understand some of um, these things. Or what is a conjugated protein? What does it mean by a conjugated protein? What does it mean by a conjugated protein? So first of all, you must understand that an amino acid is simply an organic compound that contains what an amide group and a carboxylic or a carboxyl group. I repeat. But before I talk about amino acid, you must know that proteins are made up of what? Amino acid. Uh -huh. So let me not confuse you guys. Proteins, proteins are made up of what? Amino acid. A, amino acid. And again, amino acid comprises of what? Uh, NH2, 
that is the amide group and then a carboxylic or a carboxyl group that is COOH. So if you see a compound with this and this plus an R, then you are talking to about you are talking about an amino acid. An amino acid. And amino acid, we have to call a, a conjugated protein. A conjugated protein. A conjugated protein. Conjugated protein. And this is a protein, or these are proteins that function in, or they function in interaction with other chemical groups. So the only way they function best is that they are combined with other what, chemical groups. And these are non-polypeptide groups, non-polypeptide groups or non-amino acids, non-amino acids. They are usually called cofactor. These non-amino acids are called a cofactor. It's called a cofactor. And again, a cofactor can be divided into the following. We have organic cofactors and then inorganic cofactors. We have organic cofactors and inorganic cofactors. And these are needed for a conjugated protein to perform its what functions. So if I were you, I'll write this thing down. So what are the substances that is made up of organic and their cofactors and the substances that are that are uh, inorganic, but are cofactors. So if you know these things, you will know which one of these does not fall into any of the categories. And so therefore, they cannot take part in this function. They cannot take part in this function. So you can write this down. So for organic uh, cofactors, for organic cofactors, we have NAD. For organic, we have NAD. NAD. That is nicotinamide adenodinucleotide. Nicotinamide adenodinucleotide. That's NAD. Then we have FAD. That is uh, flavine adenine dinucleotide. Flavine adenine dinucleotide. That is FAD. Then we have ATP. ATP. We have AMP. AMP. We have coenzyme A or CoA. Then we have TPP, that is thymine pyrophosphate. Thymine pyrophosphate. We can talk about vitamins, glucose, and so on. So these are the organic cofactors that we have. The organic cofactors. For the inorganic cofactors, we have metal ions. Example, magnesium 2 plus, manganese 2 plus, that is MN 2 plus, sodium plus, sodium plus. These are the inorganic cofactors. So if you look at what we have in our, in our options, almost everything here is an organic cofactor, except HNO3. HNO3. And so therefore, HNO3 cannot carry out this non-protein part of a conjugated protein. They cannot take part in that process. So your answer is what? It's A. Your answer is A. All right. Moving of the daughter chromatids to the poles of a cell is observed in mitotically dividing cell. On what stage of mitotic cell is this, is this cell? So mitotic cycle is this cell. And over here, that means when we are having all these um, anaphase, prophase, metaphase, whatever, at what stage do you see the daughter chromatids moving to the poles? Moving to the poles. And this stage, and this stage is the anaphase the anaphase, the anaphase phase or stage, the anaphase. So the anaphase is simply the stage of my, mitosis after the process of metaphase. And in metaphase, these daughter cells are aligned at the equator. So usually, assuming this is a cell, okay, you will see uh, these cells aligning at the equator. 
align at the equator assuming these are the chromosomes so these are aligned at the equator okay now in uh, in anaphase these begins what to move they begin to move to the opposite side this one also move to the opposite so they begin to separate from each other and that phase is the uh, anaphase that phase is the anaphase and when it completely move and divide into two then we start having what the telophase but over here we are talking about the anaphase so your answer here should be b should be a not b this is anaphase 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 not metaphase it is anaphase all right so your answer is a A patient with diabetes mellitus has been delivered in a hospital in a state of unconsciousness. Arterial pressure is low. Patient is or has acidosis. So at what point in a diabetic patient would the patient have acidosis? Of course, it's when there's an increase of what? Of the ketone bodies. Ketone bodies. And so therefore, this patient can be diagnosed as diabetic what? Ketoacidosis. DKA. DKA. That's the diagnosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, ketoacidosis, and to produce what acidity in the blood. So your answer is what ketone bodies, ketone bodies. We have a 58 year old female who has undergone surgery for necrotic bowel. Despite having treated with antibiotics, on post-operative day five, she develops symptoms such as fever, hypotension, tachycardia declining of urine output and confusion consistent with septic shock what hemodynamic support would be helpful then when a person is suffering from septic shock what do you do as a physician or what can you do as a physician as a physician first of all don't forget that this person is in what is in shock that means bp is getting what low so to maintain it you must give what fluid to maintain it you must give what fluid you must give what fluid great and again you can also know that this person is developing what a tachycardia tachycardia and of course declining of the urine output meaning that the heart is not also what beat pumping enough blood to circulation and so therefore kidney failure is about to ensue so again you give a drug that can help the heart that can what help the heart and so therefore you can give what dobutamine dobutamine the butamin or the butamin so these things can help sustain the patient so the dobutamin will help the patient to a bit relax in a way and the fluid will also increase the volume to increase the volume so here you are thinking of what fluid and the butamin infusions the butamin infusion so your answer should be d your answer should be d Now it was proven that a molecule of immature messenger RNA contains more triplets than amino acid formed in the synthesized protein. The reason for that for that is that translation is normally preceded by, and before we have translation, what must we have? Of course, you must have what processing. You must have the code processing, processing, processing processing yes you can say transcription but transcription comes out of what processing transcription comes out of what processing processing so here we are talking of what processing so but first of all what is a transcription a transcription is simply what the synthesis of rna is the synthesis of rna from or under the direction of dna to produce messenger rna to produce messenger rna messenger rna now in an immature messenger rna in an immature messenger rna we have what we call introns and then exons introns and then exons introns and then what exons introns and then exons So now these two cannot move together or these two cannot be found in a matured messenger RNA. So they need to undergo through a process called what? Splicing. So to be splice, splicing, 
S P L I C I N G. To so know to, to undergo through a process called what? splicing before it can be what translated before it can be translated. So again, we are referring to what immature. So immature, we are doing what processing. It is still in the uh, processing phase. Processing phase. All right. So the answer is what D. A patient has a low rate of magnesium ions that are necessary for fixing of ribosomes to the endoplasmic reticulum. It is known that it causes a disturbance of protein biosynthesis. At what stage is protein biosynthesis impaired? Is protein biosynthesis impaired? So first of all, we are saying that in eukaryotic cells or in normal cells, Transcription occurs in the nucleus, okay, in a normal cell or in an eukaryotic cell. Transcription takes place in the nucleus, whilst translation takes place in the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm. And the site for translation in the cytoplasm is actually what? On the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It is on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is aided by ribosomes which is aided by ribosomes. So therefore, if we are saying that there is a prevention of the attachment of ribosomes to this endoplasmic reticulum, what it means is that translation cannot take place. Translation cannot take place. Translation cannot take place. So therefore, translation will be impaired. Again, transcription takes place inside the nucleus. But over here, we are talking about what? the cytoplasm because endoplasmic reticulum is found inside the cytoplasm, not the nucleus, not the nucleus. And again, we are saying that before uh, transition will take place, ribosomes must be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. All right. We have 54-year-old, fifth day after surgical operation. Erythrocyte is 3.6, Hem uh, hemoglobin is 95, erythrocyte uh, hemoglobin co color index, simple, is what? It's 0 0.78. Leukocyte is 16. Leukocyte is 16. That is quite high. Platelet is 450. That is almost at the top level. Then we have anisocytosis, poikilocytosis. Reticulocyte is 3.8%. That is a little bit high. So what anemia is this patient? Don't forget this patient went to a surgery. And this is the fifth day. This is the what? Fifth day. So that means that this person could be suffering from what? From a chronic post-hemorrhagic anemia. A chronic post-hemorrhagic anemia. Now we can't think of iron deficiency because color index is almost okay. 7, 0.78 is almost okay. So you can be thinking of what? Iron deficiency. In hemolytic, you could be thinking of what? Increase in bilirubin, uh, bilirubin levels. Increase in bilirubin levels. And if it was to be hypoplastic, then the cell types, all of them might be affected. All the cell, but platelet is okay. Uh, red blood cells is quite okay. So that means we can rule that what? Hypoplastic. Now we are left with what? Acute and then chronic. In acute, uh, incident, that is when we have the trauma and then there's a large volume of blood loss and stuff like that. Okay, so that when we talk about acute, but in chronic, it takes place after some time. That's when you know that some, somebody is what, bleeding, bleeding inside, is bleeding inside. So here, we are thinking of what, of a chronic sorry, 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 sorry. They say five days. Five days, sorry. So five days should even be acute. It's not that long. Five days should be acute. Now, in people who uh, are like um, the ladies who go through menstruation, okay? So those who go through menstruation, they normally have what? The chronic form of post-hemorrhagic anemia. Chronic form. Because it takes months for the anemia to start showing. So over here, yes, we are thinking of acute of acute rather than chronic. It's acute rather than chronic, okay? And again, because of acute, 
reticulocytes are increased to compensate for loss of blood. So the answer is C, not E. It's acute, not chronic. All right. We have the patient with pneumonia was treated with antibiotics for a long period of time. Now, the answer we'll give here is the reason why we don't give too much of our antibiotics or we don't give antibiotics for quite a long time. Maximum one week, maximum two weeks is done. You don't take more with antibiotics. Why? We shall explain. Now, after treatment, patient complains of frequent and watery stool, abdominal pain. What is the reason? So the reason why we don't give too much or long duration for uh, antibiotics is because there will be uh, what we call intestinal dysbacteriosis. Intestinal dysbacteriosis. And the term intestinal dysbacteriosis is referring to a microbial imbalance. A microbial imbalance. That means that, you know, the normal GIT also have their own what, microflora or they have their own what, microorganisms. Now, if too much antibiotics is there, it will even kill the normal microflora that is needed in the body. Normal microflora that is needed in the body will be killed as well. And that will lead to what we call this bacteriosis or this biosis. This bi that means there's what irregular balance of the microorganisms inside the GIT. So therefore, it will lead to the following what symptoms. And hence, your answer is A. Great. A 16 year old patient got numerous traumas. Numerous. Now he's having a shock. Shock means that low BP. And look at it 80 60. That means there's too much volume of blood. It's lost from the accident or from the trauma. Now, urine level is 60 80. That is oligorrhea. That is too low. At least you must get to 1,000 mils or one liter a day. Now, the question is, what is the mechanism that is leading to kidney function variation? Again, you are dealing with what, a shock, dealing with what volume of blood loss, volume, volume. So you're dealing with, with fluid. So what of fluid, what comes to mind? Of course, you are thinking of what hydrostatic pressure. You are definitely thinking of hydrostatic pressure. And it is decrease in uh, volume of blood. It means that there's what, a decrease of hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerular capillaries, inside the capillaries. Decreased hydrostatic pressure. Decreased hydrostatic pressure. So your answer is A. All right. A 46 year old patient has complained of headache, fatigue, chest, pains in the spine and in the joint for the last two years. Clinically observed, there's disproportional enlargement of the hands, feet, nose. Guys, do you remember when we talk about the growth hormone? Yes. When too much of um, growth hormone are produced, what happened? It will lead to an enlargement or disproportion of the hands, the feet, the nose, and so many other things. And look at it. He has to buy a bigger shoe. That's like three times. Three times bigger, three times bigger. So what is the reason? The reason is that too much of what growth hormone are being, what are being produced. Too much of growth hormone are being produced. And when too much of growth hormone is being produced, what happens? The cartilages begin to what, proliferate faster than normal. So here we are looking at what? Cartilaginous tissue proliferations under growth hormone influence. The cartilage, the, the, uh, Gatilages are actually part of the what? The bone. The bone. The bone. So these bone tissues are proliferating more due to the action of growth hormone on them. That is why the answer is B. A 55 year old patient with continuing ventricular arrhythmia was admitted to the hospital. The patient is taking. Uh, Tamolol drops for glaucoma. And you know, glaucoma means was, there's increase in pressure inside the eye. So then think what? Dimolol drops. Daily insulin injections for diabetes, okay? So insulin too has been given. Now also have ACE inhibitor for hypertension. ACE inhibitors for hypertension. Then 
you have decided to use phenytoid instead of procanamide. What is the reason? Why will you use phenytoid instead of procanamide? Why will you use phenytoid instead of procanamide? So first of all, procanamide is an anticholinergic drug. Anticholinergic drug that is used for the treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac arrhythmias. Now, this has side effects. This procanamide has side effects. And it causes mydriasis. When I say mydriasis, it means what? Dilation of the people, of the eye. It also increases intra-eye pressure. Intra-eye pressure. And I said glaucoma means what? Increase in what? Eye pressure. So if you're taking a, a drug that also leads to increasing uh, eye pressure, that means you are causing more harm than good. So actually, this procanamide will be contraindicated for people suffering from what? Glaucoma. For people suffering from what? Glaucoma. Now, phenytoin, on the other hand, is an anti-seizure medication. Anti-seizure medication. And it is used to stop all types of what? Seizures. Also, it is used for heart arrhythmia and neuropathic pain. It is also used for what? Heart arrhythmia. Heart arrhythmia. And they are saying that this patient is continuing a treatment for what? A ventricular arrhythmia. So we're looking for a drug that can be able to work for arrhythmia and at the same time will not cause damage to the eye or will not lead to more pressure in the eye. And so therefore, we are using what? A phenytoin instead of what? A procanamide. So here, what is the reason? Again, the reason is because this procanamide is an anticholinergic and hence will aggravate glaucoma. Will ag aggravate glaucoma. So the answer is A. A 25 year old woman with red and itchy eczematoid dermatitis, that means allergic is coming in, versus your office. She had a dental procedure one day earlier with administration of a local anesthetic. There were no other findings, although she indicated that she had a history of allergic reaction. Okay. Which of the following drugs is most likely involved? Which of the following drug is most likely involved? And usually, without even knowing this, usually when you go to the eye, when you go to the dental clinics, they used to call Novocaine as a local anesthetic drug. Novocaine or Procaine. They use Procaine as a local anesthetic what, drug that is used primarily to reduce the pain of intramuscular injection. And it's also used in dentistry. It is used in dentistry. It is used in dentistry. So the question now is that which of the following drug was most likely what used? So here you are talking about a procaine. 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 Because that is the drug that normally used in the dentistry. In the dentistry. And this could have led to what we are experiencing here, like the patient having what allergies. 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 So the answer is A. The CNS stimulation produced by metals and teens, such as caffeine, is most likely due to the antagonism of the following receptor. Many of you know what caffeine do. Caffeine excites you, right? That's why if you, if you don't want to sleep and you take caffeine, you'll be super, 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 super hyper. You'll be super, super hyper. It increases your, your energy and makes you feel more alert. It makes you feel more alert. And this is because they interact with the adenosine receptors in the brain. Adenosine receptors in the brain. Because these are excitatory what, uh, receptors. Excitatory receptors. Excitatory receptors. All right, so here I'm talking about adenosine receptors. Adenosine receptors. All right, so the answer is D. Patient with similar complaints applied to the doctor, weakness, pain in intestine, disorder of the GIT, examination of the feces revealed that one patient with four nucleases, four nucleases was hospitalized immediately. What is the procedure? 
what is the procedure? Again, the procedure here with four nuclear cysts, we are talking about what we are referring to what a decentric amoeba, a decentric amoeba, a decentric amoeba, a decentric amoeba. So here you are looking at what at D, a decentric amoeba, decentric amoeba. I don't know why they brought uh, intestina because. Yeah, actually almost the same because this protozoa can also be found in the intestine. Okay, just that it's causing more havoc in the intestine. All right, so here we are looking at what's a dysenteric amoeba because amoeba has four nuclei, four nuclear cysts, four nuclear cysts. You can do that on your own. Check the number of cysts uh, an amoeba is having and you'll be able to know that this is what uh, a dysenteric amoeba. We have, according to the data of who, for about 250 blah, 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 of health population for ill with malaria. This disease is mostly spread in the tropical. The question is, what type of mosquitoes spread malaria? And your answer is what? Anopheles mosquito. Anopheles mosquito. So please don't confuse yourself. Anopheles mosquitoes. We have a labeled amino acid, alanine, and then tryptophan were injected to a mouse in order to study localization of protein synthesis in its cells. Now, the amino acid will be accumulated near the following organelles. Near the following organelles. Again, what is involved in protein synthesis? What is involved in protein synthesis? We talked about this the last, uh, I think, four slides when we talk about what proteins, translation, and we say translation takes place inside the what? The cytoplasm. To be specifically, they take place on the endoplasmic reticulum with the aid of what? Ribosomes. With the aid of ribosomes. So, if this alanine and tryptophan were injected into the mouse, then where do you think the amino acid will be located will be located definitely these will be located inside the ribosomes inside the ribosomes inside the ribosomes now don't confuse smooth endoplasmic reticulum with a rough endoplasmic reticulum in lysosomes where or the endoplasmic reticulum we are talking about where uh, protein synthesis takes place is a rough endoplasmic reticulum, not the smooth. It's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And why is it called rough? Because it has on it ribosomes. It has on its surfaces ribosomes. That's why it's called what? The rough endoplasmic reticulum, not smooth. Not smooth. So over here, even what, even they, they had brought rough, then we could have gone for, it, for the rough because the rough means ribosomes plus the endoplasmic reticulum together. So here it's going to afford E, ribosomes, ribosomes. Highly injured person gradually died. What is the indicator for biological death? Biological death. So first of all, you must know that death is a process. Death is a process. So write this things. The first process is what we call pre-agony. Pre-agony. Second stage, the agony. The agony. Third stage, clinical death. That means that injury is reversible. Injury is reversible. Then we have the biological death. Biological death, where, where injury is irreversible. Injury is irreversible. Injury is irreversible. And normally, why is it irreversible is because there is autolysis or there is destruction of the cell. There is destruction of the cell. So we have what to call it autolysis, autolysis or autolysis, autolysis. And of course, when your bodies are decayed or they are not going to what autolysis, then obviously you are just dead. But some people can be at a hospital claim to be dead, but they are still alive. And those ones, we call it what? We are referring it to what we call the clinical death. So clinically, you could be dead, but biologically, you're not dead. 
Uh-huh. So when you go and embarrass someone after some time, clinical death has ensued because this person's body will start with decaying. To start decaying. Hey, please, the answer is autolysis, not absence of movement. It's autolysis. Let me write it down. It's A. Not E. It's A. After breeding with poisonous st steams, there's an increased quantity of slime in respiratory passages of a chemical production worker. What respiratory tract epithelial cells participate in mucous moistening? In mucous moistening. And your answer is, of course, goblet cells. Goblet cells. And these are simple columnar epithelial cells inside the trachea, the bronchi, and then the large bronchioles, the large bronchioles, the large bronchioles. And the main function of the goblet cells is to secrete what? Mucus. Is to secrete mucus. And these mucus do what? They protect the mucus membrane where they are found. They protect the mucus membrane at the places that they are what? Found. So, of course, in this particular patient, substances or poisonous substances are coming into the nose, so to destroy it or to stop it or to protect the mucosa lining, the goblet cells begin to produce what mucus, begin to produce what mucus. So here, you are talking about goblet cells, goblet cells, goblet cells. Okay. A patient is suffering from thyrotoxicosis. Of course, you know the meaning of thyrotoxicosis is that's hyper, uh, hyper what? Thyroid. Hyperthyroidism. Mm -hmm. A patient is suffering from thyrotoxicosis. Symptoms of vegetal asthenic syndrome was revealed. The following, which of the following would show histological appearance of the thyroid gland stimulated by the uh, thyroid stimulating hormone? What they mean is they want to know the epithelium or the epithelia of the thyroid gland. They want to know the epithelia of the thyroid gland. And these thyroid glands are normally what? Columnar shaped. They are columnar shaped. Columnar shaped. Columnar shaped. So here, you are looking at for what? For uh, B, columnar shape. Columnar shape. Columnar shape. All right. Now, aside that, you must know that, you must know that columnar epithelium are normally found in the digestive tract. They are found when the digestive tract referring to the stomach, the small intestine, large intestine, and the uterus, perhaps. So that's where simple columnar epithelial tissues are normally found. Are normally found. They also have what they call the follicular cells. Follicular cells. These are cells that are in the thyroid gland that are responsible for the production and the secretion of what? the thyroid hormones. They are responsible for the secretion of the thyroid hormones. And actually, these follicular cells, these follicular cells are supposed to be cuboidal. They are supposed to be what? Cuboidal, 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 cuboidal. So, of course, in the respiratory system and everything, we are looking for what? columnar cells. But with the uh, thyroid or, yeah, the follicular cells, we are looking at what? At the cuboidal. But there's no cuboidal in this question, okay? So our best bet is still the columnar-shaped follicular cells. Columnar-shaped. But it's supposed to be cuboidal. I'm, saying you, I'm telling you this so that you put it back of your mind. The GIT, the respiratory tract, we are looking for it. We are looking for it for the columnar cells. Columnar cells. But cuboidal is what we look at for in the follicular cells. In the follicular cells. And of course, we can also see it in the salivary gland. Can you mute your microphone? Uh, Yima? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Yima. Great. So basically, that is that. All right. The reason for the reason of occurrence of some diseases of the oral cavity is connected with the structural peculiarities of the mucous membrane. What 
morphological attributes characterize these features. So that means in your mouth, what are the layers inside the mouth? The layers inside the mouth. So in the oral cavity, it consists of only two layers. Only two layers. And these are the stratified squamous epithelium and then the deep lamina propria. Again, we have the stratified squamous epithelium and then we have the deep lamina propria. The deep lamina propria. So let's look at it. So over here, we are looking at what? The best bet would be what? The A. Our best bet should be what? The A. That means it has no muscular mucus, or, but it has what? Stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified. They didn't bring the deep layer proper or the deep, uh, the deeper part. They didn't bring it. But then your answer is still what? Correct. So you have what? No muscles there. However, we have stratified epithelia there. All right. There is the change of teeth at six to eight year old children. Six to eight year old children. Decisions are replaced by permanent. Replaced by permanent. What embryonic tissues are the sources of formation permanent teeth tissue? What embryonic tissues are the sources of formation of the permanent teeth? In other words, which one of these is involved in teeth? development or teeth formation teeth formation actually these are normally referred to as the germ layers the germ layers they are referred to as the germ layers the germ layers and we have what we call the ectoderm we have the mesoderm and then what the endoderm ectoderm mesoderm and then what the endoderm these are the main uh, germinal layers that we have, that we have. Now, the tooth is derived from the ectoderma or the ectoderm. The tooth is derived from the ectoderm, the ectoderm, the ectoderm, the ectoderm. So that's over here, we are looking for what, an answer relating to what? The ectoderm, the ectoderm. Now, again, let me just add some few things to it. The ectoderm differentiates into the nervous system. It differentiates into the nervous system. So if you see a problem with the nervous system, then we are talking about ectoderm. So the nervous system, tooth enamel, the epidermis, that is the outer part of the, of the skin. It also forms part of the lining of the mouth, the anus, the nostrils, sweat glands, hair, and nails. So all of these things is coming from what? The ectoderm. Again, the nervous system, the tooth, the epidermis, that's the outer layer. Then the mouth, the nose, the nostrils, sweat glands, hair and nails. Hair and nails. Now the middle part or the mesoderm, they differentiate into the security system. They differentiate to form the circulatory system the lungs, the skeletal system, and then the muscular system, the muscular system, skeletal system, the circulatory system, and then the lungs. The endoderm, which is the inner part, differentiate to form the digestive system. It differentiate to form the digestive system, the liver, the pancreas, and then the lungs. It affects the liver, the pancreas, the lungs, and then the, what, the digestive system. So over here, we are looking for, what, for the ectoderm. So B will be our most likely what, answer. B will be our most likely answer. Now the term mesenchyme, the term mesenchyme is simply a connective tissue that is found mostly during the development of the embryo. Tissues found during the development of the embryo. That's missing kind. So by over here, your answer is what B. The B cells of the endocrine portion of the pancreas are selectively damaged by alloxane poisoning. How will it ref how will it be reflected inside the blood? Now, when the B cells 
are damaged by a poison, what happens? It means the B cells are destroyed. So the, and you know that B cells is responsible for the production of what? Insulin. Beta cells or B cells. And insulin do what? It reduces sugar concentration inside the blood. That's the function of insulin. So if this insulin is being destroyed or the B cells are being destroyed, what it means is that there will be an impaired flow or there will be an insufficiency of insulin inside the blood. And that will mean that sugar level will increase. Will increase. So the answer is E. It will increase, not decrease. Increase. All right. In some regions of South Africa, there is a spread of sickle-shaped cell anemia in which erythrocyte has half the shape of a sickle as a result of substitution of glutamine by valine. What is the cause? Of course, this is a gene mutation. This is a gene mutation, a gene mutation where glutamine is being replaced by valine. So your answer is what? Gene mutation. Gene mutation. We have a female patient consulted a physician about the digestive system. Extended abdominal pain. Examination revealed drastic decrease in hemoglobin. It is known from analysis that while living in the Far East, the patient used to eat Freshly sorted caviar. Freshly sorted. Some relatives living with hair had similar condition. So that means that this disease is coming from what? A freshly sorted caviar. So usually, eating raw or uncooked sorted fish will cause what we call liver fluke or liver flukes. It can cause tapeworms. Tapeworms, that is not as what? Uh, the diphylobacteriasis, diphylobacteriasis, or diphylobotriasis. Yes, it is diphylobotriasis. It can also lead to ringworms infestation, like anisakiasis, 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 anisakiasis. So basically, that is what we deal with. So over here, we are referring to what? We said two things. Either liver flukes, also known as op opistochiasis. Opistochiasis. That's a liver fluke infestation. Opis, opistochiasis. Opistochiasis. But over here, we are looking at what? At diphylobotriasis. Diphylobotriasis. So your answer is what? Is D. Your answer is D. And the keyword here is what? Is salty fish or freshly salted calvia. The same thing, fresh fish, sorted fish, sorry. On autopsy of a stillborn infant, it is revealed heart development abnormalities, okay? Ventricles are not separated. It originates from the right uh, part of the single arterial trunk. For what class of vertebra is such heart construction? So what it means is that when you look at what they've been presented here, which of these animals have the features of this heart? Look, it has what? Ventricles are not separated. In the human bodies, ventricles are separated, right? Of course, by the what? The interventricular septa or septum. Interventricular septum. So definitely, we can rule out mammals. We can rule out mammals. So, Apart from the fact that it is not separated, the right, right part of the single trunk. Okay, so what vertebra is it? So basically, let me tell you the different kinds of uh, all these things and their heart chambers or how their heart is like. How their heart is like. How their heart is like. Okay, now fishes. Fishes have only two chambers. Fishes have two chambers. One is atrium and one is ventricle. One is atrium, one is ventricle. That is for fish. So please write it down. Write it down. For fish, we have what? Only two chambers. 
right atrium, right, sorry, one atrium, one ventricle. We also have other diseases that consist of three chambers. Three chambers. These are two atria and then one ventricle. Two atria and then the right ventricle. Examples include amphibians and reptiles. Amphibians and reptiles. Amphibians and reptiles. Now, four chambers, of course, two atrium, two atria, two ventricles. We are talking about what? Beds and mammals. Beds and mammals. Beds and mammals. Again, having a three chambered heart, like in this question, where we have one ventricle, but we have what? You see, it originates from the right part of a single atria trunk. What is the class? So over here, we are having what? A three chambered heart. And again, we will go in for what? For amphibian or for amphibians, amphibians and reptiles. But reptiles do have a partially divided ventricle. So our answer here should have been what? Amphibians and reptiles. But again, like I said, reptiles have partially divided ventricles. Partially. It's not full. Partially. So it nearly became four. Four reptiles. It nearly became four for reptiles. So here we are looking at what? Amphibians. Amphibians. All right. 